What's up guys, it's Chris Majestic, and it took well over a year, but it's finally time for the Ambilight tutorial. So you might remember in a few previous videos that I had LEDs installed around my screen that respond to the video on the screen. Well, this is known as an Ambilight setup. So what this does is capture a video signal from an HDMI device, and the LEDs mounted on the back of the screen match the video on the screen. It's a cool lighting effect that works great for certain movies, TV shows, gaming, or just to show off. Off. Now there are a few prepackaged kits out there that already do this, such as the Philips Hue gradient light strips with the HDMI sync box or the Govi LED backlights, but both of these options are inferior to the DIY option in my opinion. The problem with Philips Hue is that it costs a minimum of $430 for both the sync box and the gradient light strips. The light strips don't cover the bottom of the TV and they light up in sections instead of each LED being independent. The Govi system seems to work okay from what I've seen, but it uses a camera, which looks a little bit out of place to me, and I don't think it works well for really big projector screens. The system that we'll build in this tutorial will work for pretty much any screen. It'll be much more dramatic, more flexible, and it'll range from $150 up to $300, depending on the size of your screen and some of the optional parts you choose. Just keep in mind that it only works for external HDMI devices like a game console, Blu-ray player, or streamer, so it won't work for the built-in apps on your TV. So today I wanna show you exactly how to set this up. Now I know there are a few tutorials out there on this already, but they miss quite a few important points, so I figured it was worth doing my own. Okay, so exactly how does this work? Well, we'll use an HDMI splitter to split a video signal to your TV and a Raspberry Pi. Then we'll use an HDMI to USB capture device to capture the video on the Pi. And an application called Hyperion will process the video and send a signal to the LEDs. So there are a bunch of parts that are needed for this project. First, I'm gonna mention all the required parts. And as I go through the tutorial, I'll mention some of the optional parts. And I'll put a complete list of everything that I mentioned in the video description. So the required parts include a Raspberry Pi, I recommend the Pi 4 or the Pi 3, a five volt power supply, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, an HDMI to USB grabber, an HDMI splitter, which I'll talk about at length later in the video, a USB power adapter for the Pi, some jumper wires, electrical wire, an SD card, WS2812B individually addressable LED strips, and the LED strips do come with different levels of water resistance. I usually recommend IP30 since most people don't need water resistance, but IP65 also works just fine. All right, so the very first thing you need to do is measure all the way around your screen so you know how long of an LED strip you need to buy. The strips usually come in lengths of around three feet or 16 feet, so you'll likely end up with a 16 foot strip for most TVs and two 16 foot strips for a projector screen. So I'm gonna be using a Raspberry Pi 4 for this project, and the very first thing we need to do after we buy all of our parts is to get the Hyperion software installed on the Pi. So the easiest way to do this is to use what's known as Hyperbian. So this is basically a prepackaged image of the Raspberry Pi OS with Hyperion already installed, which makes our lives much easier. And if you're already familiar with how to work with the Raspberry Pi, then you could always install Hyperion manually if you want. So to get Hyperbian installed, you need to download a free application called Belina Etcher. And I'll put links in the video description for both the Hyperbian download and the Etcher software. Once you have the Hyperbian file downloaded and you have the Belina Etcher software installed, you'll need to plug in your SD card using an SD card reader and launch the Etcher software. Then you're gonna click the flash from file button and choose the Hyperbian file you just downloaded. Then you're gonna click select target and click the checkbox next to your SD card. Now it's important that you choose the right drive because this is gonna delete everything on the drive you choose. Once you found the SD card, go ahead and click select, then click flash. After about a minute or so, the flash should be successful. Successful. Now, even though we won't be using SSH in this tutorial, I do recommend enabling it on your Raspberry Pi. Now, even though I'm gonna be using a wire connection, another thing you can do while you're here is configure Wi-Fi on the Pi. Now, there are a couple of ways you can do this, but for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into that in this video, but I do have a full written tutorial for everything I'm talking about in this video today, so you can go there for more info. So now that we have Hyperbian installed on the SD card, we can go ahead and install the SD card into the Pi. You'll need to plug a USB power adapter into your Pi and connect a network cable if you're not using Wi-Fi. And once you get it booted up, you will have to find a way to get the IP address of the Pi. 
Now, if you have a keyboard and monitor connected to the Pi, then this is really easy. But if not, then there are a couple of ways you can still get it. You can get it from the web interface on your router if you're familiar with that, or a really easy way is to download the Thing app. All you do is launch the app, click scan for devices and look for Hyperbian in the list. And you should see it somewhere in that list along with the IP address. So once you do have the IP address, we can go ahead and open a web browser and enter the IP address of the Pi, followed by a colon and 8090. And this should take you right to the Hyperion web interface. Once you open up the interface, the first thing you're gonna see is a pop-up telling you to change the default password so you can go ahead and change it. For now, we're not really gonna make any changes in Hyperion, but we're gonna come back later to set it up. Now, before we dive too deep into the Hyperion settings, I wanted to spend some time talking about HDMI splitters. So one of the major requirements of this project is capturing a video signal from a device. Now, again, this won't work for the apps built into your smart TV. This means we're gonna be using an external streaming device such as a Roku, Fire Stick, Chromecast, Nvidia Shield, or Apple TV. The problem with splitting an HDMI signal is that HDCP or high bandwidth digital content protection makes it difficult since it encrypts the video signal and makes it hard to duplicate. So because of this, if you want to watch 4K HDR movies with an HDMI splitter, you're probably gonna run into issues with a cheap splitter. Thankfully, I found a few splitters that work so I can give you some options. Now, if you have a modern home theater receiver, this might work just fine, but it doesn't usually work that well for 4K HDR. So if you don't care about 4K HDR, you can use your home theater receiver and you don't need to buy a splitter. Now, if you still do need a splitter and you still don't care about 4K HDR or you just have a 1080p TV, then you can use an HDMI to USB capture device with loop out. This thing is pretty inexpensive and works as both an HDMI splitter and a USB capture, so you wouldn't need to purchase a separate splitter. And this does support 4K, but it doesn't support 4K HDR. So again, if you're okay with that, then this is a good way to save a few bucks. Now, the better option would be to buy a cheap HDMI to USB capture device and then buy a separate HDMI splitter. Now, there are some cheaper splitters out there to support 4K HDR, but the problem is that when you watch HDR, the video will look perfect on your TV, but the second HDMI output will have washed out colors. This means that your Ambilight LEDs will lack color and won't match the colors on the screen. Now, the best option I've found so far for this is the GoFanco Prophecy Gaming HDMI splitter, which cost about a hundred bucks. Now, I know a hundred dollars isn't cheap, but this is the cheapest splitter I've found that sends full HDR to your TV and does HDR to SDR tone mapping on the second HDMI output. This is exactly what we need for our setup, so I highly recommend this splitter. The only downside I found to this splitter is that it doesn't support HDMI CEC. So if you're used to controlling your streaming devices with your TV remote or having all of your devices power on or off automatically, then this is gonna break that functionality. Now there is one way to fix this, but you're gonna need some pretty deep pockets. The fix is to buy the HD Fury Diva 4K HDR splitter. This is a $450 high-end HDMI splitter that does everything you could ever imagine. It supports HDMI CEC, custom EDID profiles, and has multiple HDR to SDR tone mapping presets and does a ton of other things that you'll probably never use. So if you're doing this project in a mid to high range home theater, then I highly recommend this splitter. So once you've chosen a splitter, you can go ahead and connect your devices to it. So if you're using a USB grabber with loop out, then you can go ahead and connect your video source to the port labeled input, then connect your TV or projector to the output. Then you're gonna connect both of the included USB cables to the grabber and plug the other ends into the Raspberry Pi. If you're using a GoFanco Prophecy, then you're gonna connect your video source to the port labeled source, connect your HDMI to USB grabber to the fourth HDMI output, connect your TV to HDMI one, and then you're gonna set this dip switch into the down position, which is gonna enable the HDR to SDR conversion. And if you're using the HD Fury Diva, then you're gonna connect your video source to HDMI zero, connect your TV to HDMI TX zero, connect the HDMI USB grabber to HDMI TX one, plug in an ethernet cable since we need a network connection, and then you're gonna plug the power cord into the wall. So once you get that all set up, you're gonna open your web browser and enter the IP address of the Diva. Then you're gonna to navigate to the tools tab at the top of the page. Under the HDR to SDR section, you're gonna select profile one. 
So once you have the HDMI splitter and HDMI to USB grabber all connected, we can go ahead back into the Hyperion web interface and get everything all set up. So don't worry about installing your LEDs just yet since we wanna make sure that they work properly before we install them. So first things first, we wanna go ahead and turn on dark mode by clicking the moon icon up at the top. So now you can take off your shades and click on the wrench icon in the upper right hand corner and click settings level. So we're gonna go ahead and change the settings level to advanced. So now we're gonna go ahead and change a few preliminary settings so we can test out the LED strip. So we're gonna go ahead to configuration and then click on LED hardware. This is where you set up the communication between the Pi and the LED strip. So first we're gonna go ahead and set the controller type to WS281X. Then we're gonna change the RGB byte order to GRB. And for the maximum LED light count, we're gonna go ahead and put in 300, assuming that you're gonna use at least a 16 foot strip. And if you're using two 16 foot strips, then you can go ahead and put in 600 here. Again, these are just gonna be temporary numbers that we're gonna use until we know exactly how many LEDs we have installed on the screen. And we're gonna leave the rest of the settings as their default since we are gonna be using GPIO 18 on the Raspberry Pi, so go ahead and click save. Now we're gonna head over to the LED layout tab at the top of this page. So in here, we're also gonna enter some temporary numbers, but if you already had the LEDs mounted on the back of your screen, you would count exactly how many LEDs you have at the top, bottom, left, and right of your screen and enter them here. For now, we're gonna go ahead and put in 96 for the top and bottom and 54 for the left and right. This should be equal to 300 total LEDs, which you can see here. Now, one thing that is helpful on this page is max power consumption, which you should take note of to give you an idea of what size power supply you might need. So as you can see, 300 LEDs could require up to nearly 20 amps. Now, I found that this estimate is a little high, but it's still helpful. So as you can see here, you can specify the location of a gap in case your TV won't allow for you to run LEDs all the way across the bottom, or if you simply don't have enough LEDs and need a gap. And you can also specify an input position, which is the place where your LED strip starts. You can even reverse the direction if you install them clockwise by mistake. So even if you don't get the LEDs mounted perfectly on the back of your screen, you can always come back here and tweak the settings. So for now, we're gonna go ahead and click Save Layout. And the next thing we need to do is set up your capture hardware. So go ahead and go to the capturing hardware section under configuration. So what we're gonna do here is uncheck the platform capture since we're not gonna be using that. This is what you would use if you planned on using the Raspberry Pi itself as a media player and wanted to capture the internal video. Now we are gonna go ahead and click the USB capture checkbox and click save settings. Then we're gonna go ahead and scroll down to the USB capture section. If we click on device, we should see our USB capture device. If all you see is automatic ISP capture and custom, that means that it can't find our USB capture device. If we don't see it listed, then there are a couple of things we can try. First, we can try unchecking the USB capture box, click save, wait a few seconds, then recheck the box and click save again. If that doesn't work, then you can plug the capture device into a different USB port and refresh the page. If it still doesn't work, then you can reboot the Pi. A reboot almost always works as long as the capture device you're using is supported. Once you see your capture device listed, you're gonna go ahead and set the input to camera one, or you can leave that set to auto, set the video standard to NTSC, set the device resolution to 720 by 480. Keep in mind that the lower the resolution, the less lag you'll have. I usually set my frames per second to 30, even though some people choose 20, and I set the size decimation to four. So later on, you can always come back here and play around with these settings so you can decrease the lag. And the last setting I wanna enable is internet API access. This is gonna allow us to control the LEDs using your phone or some other internet connected device. To enable this, you're gonna click on network services under configuration and check the box that says internet API access and click save. Now at this point, we should be able to see a capture image on the Pi. So if you scroll to the top of the page and click on the little TV icon, then click on live video, you should see the captured image. So as you can see, this screen gives you a preview of the captured image and the LEDs around the screen. And the captured image doesn't have to be the highest quality since all we really care about is the colors. So now that we know that the splitter and HDMI grabbers are both working properly, now we can focus on powering and testing the LED strip. Now this might seem basic, but it can get pretty complicated if you're doing it right. So first we need to calculate the amount of amperage we need so we know what size power supply to buy. So to do this, we use a simple calculation. Each LED in the strip uses around 20 to 60 milliamps, so we multiply 0.06 times the number of LEDs in the strip. 
So most LED strips come in lengths of three feet or 16 feet. Now I usually recommend the WS2812B strips that have 60 LEDs per meter since they look the best. So the 16 foot strip will have 300 LEDs. So if we have a strip of 300 LEDs, we multiply 300 times 0.06 and we get 18, which is about 18 amps. Now, unfortunately, most power brick style power supplies usually go up to about 15 amps. So finding one that supports 18 amps or higher will be really difficult. Now, keep in mind that the LEDs will usually work just fine with an underpowered power supply, but they just will have limited brightness. Now, if you do need more than 15 amps, then you'll start to see metal power supplies, which usually have exposed connection terminals. What this means is that you'll have to connect bare AC voltage wires to the power supply, which can be dangerous if you don't take the necessary precautions. At minimum, this means that you'll probably want to put the power supply inside of a project box for safety. Now, the alternative to a large metal power supply will be to buy multiple power bricks. So for example, if you needed 30 amps, then you could buy two 15 amp power supplies and wire them together and connect both to the LED strip, which would be a total of 30 amps. And even though I do recommend using a separate USB power supply for the Raspberry Pi, you could technically power your Raspberry Pi using the same five volt power supply. So if you wanna do that, then you'll need to factor in another three amps for the Pi. So now that we know exactly what power supply we need, we can go ahead and power the LED strip. So for most applications, I usually recommend 16 gauge wire to power the strips, especially if the LEDs will be positioned more than six feet away from the power supply. Now, some LED strips come with an extra connector that you can use to splice to your wires to make it easy to connect to the LED strip. Now, the wire colors on the LED strips do vary between brands, so the best way to determine the wire color is to look at the markings on the strip itself and see which wires are connected to which contacts on the strip. So with the WS2812B LED strips, the two outside wires are the power wires and the wire in the middle is the data wire. Now, before you start splicing your wires, you need to take note of the direction of the small black arrows on the LED strip. These small black arrows should be pointing away from the wire since the data connection is directional, so it's important to make sure you're connecting the data wire at the right end. Once you've made sure you're at the right end, you can go ahead and splice your power wires and the data wire to the LED strip. And the other end of these wires will be connected to the power supply and the Raspberry Pi. So with the power supply disconnected from the wall outlet, you can go ahead and splice the positive and negative wires to the power supply. And to connect the data wire to the Raspberry Pi, you'll need to use a jumper wire. So you can go ahead and splice the data wire to a jumper wire and plug the jumper wire into GPIO 18 on the Raspberry Pi. So GPIO 18 is gonna be on the outside row of the GPIO pins and is the sixth pin from the end. Now, one thing that is important to note is to make sure that you connect a ground wire between the Raspberry Pi and the ground on the power supply. If your power supply and Raspberry Pi don't share a common ground, then you're likely gonna run into erratic flickering from the LED strip. So it's best to use another jumper wire to splice one end of the ground wire to the power supply and plug the other end into the third pin on the same row as GPIO 18, which is a ground connection. Now, one thing I haven't seen too many people talk about in tutorials is voltage drop. So most five volt LED strips over three feet or so usually suffer from this. So voltage drop causes variations in colors at the far end of the LED strip and is especially noticeable when trying to produce white. Now there are two ways around this issue. The best option is to power the LED strip at multiple locations. So the most common method is to inject power into the LED strip at the beginning, middle, and end of the strip. Now this might seem weird, but it works perfectly and ensures that your entire strip gets consistent power, which helps tremendously with voltage drop. So most LED strips usually have an extra set of power wires at the beginning and end of the strip, which works perfectly for you to do this. Another way to address voltage drop is to use a 12 volt LED strip such as the WS2815. So the good thing about 12 volt LED strips is that they can go a much longer distance without any noticeable voltage drop. So the WS2815 has all of the features of the 2812B, but adds the 12 volt benefit as well as an additional data channel. So instead of three pins, the WS2815 has four pins. The two middle channels are both used for data. One is the primary and one is the backup. So even though it does have two data lines, you're still gonna use the one data line from the Raspberry Pi and you're gonna splice both of the data connections to that one wire. Now, if you do choose to go with the 2815 strip, then you will need to make sure you use a 12 volt power supply. And the same amperage calculation that we used earlier still applies, so you wanna make sure that you get a 12 volt power supply that has as close to the amperage requirement as possible. 
Now, if you are gonna use a 12 volt power supply, you don't wanna plug in your Raspberry Pi into this unless you're using a step down voltage regulator. Otherwise, you're gonna destroy your Pi. This is another reason why I normally recommend using a separate USB adapter to power the Pi. Now, one thing I wanna briefly mention is that Adafruit does recommend using a capacitor on the power wires, as well as a 470 ohm resistor on the data wires of both the 2812B and the WS2815 LED strips. Now, I found that both of these strips work just fine without a capacitor or a resistor, but feel free to add them if you want. And the last thing I wanna talk about before we start testing the LED strip is a logic level converter. So when I first set this up on my screen in my home theater, I had an issue where the LED strips would flicker every few seconds. I looked all over the internet and I couldn't find anything. As a last ditch effort, I ended up trying one of these tiny little boards and my setup has been working perfectly ever since. Now, unfortunately, these boards don't usually come with headers on them, so you will have to solder it. But the basic idea is to power one side of the converter using five volts from the Pi and power the lower voltage side using the 3.3 pin from the Pi and then you're gonna connect a wire from GPIO 18 to channel one on the 3.3 volt side and connect the channel one output on the five volt side to the data wire on the LED strip. And I will say that if you plan on putting your Raspberry Pi farther than six feet away from your LED strip, then I highly recommend using one of these. All right, now I know I just talked about a lot, but now that we've talked about power and wiring, it's time to test out the LED strip. So now that we have the LEDs all wired up and ready for testing, the easiest way to test them is gonna be to use the app. And in order for the app to work, you wanna make sure that you enable API access as we did earlier in the video. So when we open the app, we're gonna click the three dots in the upper right hand corner, go to settings, and then we're gonna tap on add server. So here we're gonna put in the IP address of our Hyperion server, which is gonna be our Raspberry Pi. Then we're gonna enter a name and then we're gonna tap okay. And when you go back, you're gonna see the color wheel. And if you tap on one of the colors on the color wheel or drag your finger along, you'll see that the LEDs respond to the colors. Now, if the LEDs are not responding here, then you can either try making sure the IP address is correct, or you can go to the Hyperion web interface and click on the live button to see if the colors match what you're choosing in the app. So once you're done checking the LEDs, it's time for you to install them on the back of your TV. Now, if you're looking at the back of your TV, then you're gonna install the LEDs counterclockwise. If you don't get it perfect, don't worry because we can always fix this later in the Hyperion settings. Now, when it comes to running the LED strips around the corners of your TV, I found that it's best to just bend the strips. And I've been doing this for years and I've never had an issue with it. Alternatively, you could use an LED corner connector or you could even solder wires in the corner if you want. Ultimately, this is up to you. Once you have the LEDs installed, you can go ahead and count the LEDs on the top, bottom, left, and right, so you can enter these exact numbers into Hyperion. And keep in mind that you don't actually have to cut the LEDs. If you have room on the back of the TV, you can actually wrap them around because in the Hyperion software, you can specify less LEDs and the LEDs at the end of the strip will be turned off. So once you have everything all connected, you can go ahead and check this wiring guide to make sure you have everything wired correctly. Now, of course your setup may vary from this since it includes some optional parts, but it should at least give you an idea. The most important thing to take note of is the ground connection between the Raspberry Pi and the power supply. All right, so if it looks like everything is working properly, we can go back into Hyperion and enter the exact numbers so we can test the system out. So you're gonna go ahead back into the Hyperion web interface and head over to the LED controller tab under LED hardware. Here we're gonna enter the actual maximum LED count, which is the full count of LEDs you have on the back of your TV. Then you're gonna head over to the LED layout tab and enter your actual LED count for each side of your screen. Now you wanna make sure that the total LED number matches the total number of LEDs you have installed. And you also wanna make sure that the position matches the input position on your screen. Also make sure you enter an estimated number for the gap if you have a gap. So once you have all your numbers entered, you can go ahead and test it out. Now I will put some links to some of my favorite Ambilight test videos in the video description if you're interested. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention is that HDMI to USB grabbers do suffer from a little bit of lag. So if you're having issues with the LEDs lagging a little behind the video, you can try lowering the video resolution or raising the size decimation number in your capture settings. All right, guys, I think this might've been the longest video I've ever done, but I do hope that this was helpful. Now, I'm not really big on doing tutorials, but considering the amount of work that I put into this, I figured it was worth sharing what I learned. If you did find this video helpful, then go ahead and make sure you hit that like button. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, go ahead and make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.